Welcome, everyone, to another episode of East Beats West at the Vice. Today, the 3rd of April, Eric Austin and Al Beattie are going to be playing around with feather slip wings. Starting off, I'm Al Beattie uh, from Boise, Idaho, and joining me from Florida is my good friend, Eric Austin. And Eric, I guess you're going to have the uh, limelight first, so you take off and I'll bow out. All right. Thanks, Al. This is a kind of a request. Um, Mike wanted to see uh, some more uh, quill flies, and this is a wet fly. It's uh, from uh, Ray Bergman's book, Trout. Uh, and uh, it's a fly called the Colonel Fuller, an old uh, brook trout wet fly. And these flies are, are really, really fun to do and always a challenge. Oh, I better... Better turn Lost on your, the camera. your video there, uh, Eric. Yeah, I know. I see. Um, there that. we go. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Um, before before I get started, here's here's the recipe for the fly. Um, it's a wet fly. Uh I, I tie these on the old Mustad 3399s. Any wet fly hook will do. Uh they're 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 usually tied fairly large. Um brook trout uh hunt. At least, at least the brook trout of of old, hunted by sight, uh, the the big brook trout in the Rangeley region, etc. And um, they they hunted by sight, so you needed a fly that was big and visible. And and a lot of times they would put a spinner on in front of the fly. Um, uh, the uh, I think it's the Lake Queer clear wabbler was one of those spinners and it's still fish today you can still buy them on long lake uh and 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 other other lakes in the fulton chain um the tip is uh gold tinsel tail is is a, a goose quill uh black goose quill i have my own method for tying that on um Small flat gold tinsel for the rib. Body is yellow floss, and I use one strand of uh, Danville's four strand floss for that rayon floss. <clears throat> and I, but it's wound both ways, so you wind up with there's actually two layers of it. Um, the hackles yellow hen, and the wings are married uh, yellow with a red stripe. And the head on these flies is always black. And uh, I just hope I remember to change to black thread at the very end. I'm liable to forget uh, because I'm very forgetful these days. This is the fly I'm going to do. It's the Colonel Fuller, the one I tied a while back. And um, it's, it's, it's meant to imitate a brook trout thin. Here's the Parmacini Bell, which also, it was sort of the uh, the first one to do this. I don't know which came first, the Colonel Fuller. I would imagine the Parmacini Bell, because it was pretty groundbreaking. And it imitated a brook trout thin, and there are lots of imitators of the Parmacini Bell. This may well be one in just different colors. Um, brook trout fins were used as bait. And that's where they came up with, that's where Henry P. Wells came up with the idea for, for this fly here. Um, I don't know the Colonel that the Colonel Fuller's named for. Um, there was a Colonel Fuller in the set in the, um, in the civil war who was somewhat famous, could have been him. There were other Colonel Fuller's throughout history. So we don't know. Um, I want to I want to show that this this is a Mary Orvis Marbury fly that's where the wings are tied tips together and tips up. There are four ways of mounting these wings. This is just one. This is the method I'll I'll use today. Here's tips up, tips apart. Okay, you just hold the feathers uh, in the opposite order to get this uh, with the tips up, obviously. Don Bastian liked this method. 
Um, this is tips down, tips together. I've seen a lot of Canadian fly, wet flies over the years tied this way, as well as a lot of the wet flies I've seen from out west. Um, they were in, in the east. They they were always tips together and tips up where I was in Plattsburgh, New York. But you know, who knows where they were elsewhere. <clears throat> And finally, tips down, tips together, which you don't, which you don't see very much. And I want to make everybody aware of a document that I did a while back that I'm very proud of. Um, let's see if we can see it here. Um, I'm going to switch over to it and just do a quick run through of this document. This is on my website and uh, on the YouTube video that I do. I'll put a link to this document. Uh, it's very in-depth about the Colonel Fuller and Married Wings both. Um, and there's lots of cool pictures in here, step-by-steps of the Colonel Fuller. Um, and I did this, I think, for the uh, FFI, did this document for the FFI uh, show a couple of years back. And never really did anything with it. Well, I finally got around to putting it on my website. And this is a uh, in-depth, you know, marrying tutorial. Uh, you know, this this bottom wing, bottom bottom feather. You don't want to use this feather because it's got crossed fibers, etc. Or and you don't want to use the top one either because it's got fibers missing. You can use parts of it, but not those parts. And uh, there's some flies that are intended to be inspirational in here, um, whether they are or not. Uh, is up to you. And let me get let me get back to me. All right, uh, let me get Ty in here. This is a number six hook. I'm gonna start just a little bit behind the eye, just leaving a small space there, enough for the head. Take the thread back to the bend. Now, <clears throat> this is a left goose quill. This is a right goose quill, the, the longest fibers on this. Oops, I'm, yeah, that's correct. The longest fibers on this, as I look at the front of it, are, are on the right. That makes it a right. And how can I tell the front from the back? Well, the back many times will have a split in the stem that's that's readily apparent, whereas the front does not have a split. So that's how you tell the front from the back, and then you know this is a right because the longest fibers are on the right. And this tail is made up of a left and a right, both. And um, I'm going to cut just four fibers or so. By the way, an, uh, you can count fibers more easily from the backs of these. Uh, it, they show up a little better, but I, I don't, you know, who's counting? I'm just gonna cut something off here that I think is about four, and then I'll, I'll pare it down if, if necessary, if it's a little too big. I'm gonna tie one, uh, Cut one off the other feather here. See how many we have here. That's three. And actually, three, th three, I would prefer three on this. So I'm going to take my, my two, I'm going to put them together, and then I'm going to uh, strip off a fiber or 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 two, whatever I need to strip off, 
and I'll 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 do that down down here uh, where you can't see it. I'm I'm sorry about this. It's just hard for me to do holding it up like that. All right, so now I've got a, a tail, and it uh, it's going to be almost almost shank length, not not shank length, a little longer than uh, a little longer than I'm sorry, hook hook length. It's almost hook length. It's longer than shank length. It's it's a tweener, if you will. Here's my technique for mounting these. Straddle the hook, take two or three relative, fairly loose wraps around, grab the butt and pull the whole thing up on top of the hook and then tighten up. And you should be able to get it dead on. So it's tented. It's still it's still around the shank, but it's around the top of the shank. When I get down here, because because these bodies always had a nice taper, I'm going to cut this at an angle um, to help with the taper. Now I'll, I'll sort of build a little bit of a taper here. Now I'm using Uni A dot thread because I, I because it was it was here on my dining table. Um, normally I would use a, a thread that flattens a little better than this for this fly, but. It's not, it's not going to matter that much. It's not going to be that significant. By the way, I've already forgotten this stage. Uh, there, is a, there is a tip that goes on here. Um, I apologize. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do it again. Um, it's it's really funny. Uh, when I did this live for the FFI thing, I I I did the same thing. So I must be obsessed with the tail or something. I don't know. Using light colored thread initially uh, because <clears throat> when gloss gets wet, if, if I use black thread, it can show through, darken the whole thing. So this is one strand of uh, Danville. Now, if it starts, if things start to separate a little on you, see how see how this floss is separating a little bit. Back off a turn and just twist it in the direction of the the uh, part that's split off. Now, 
what happens is on these on these hills, if you if you know if you if you've built a taper, as you co- go up or down, that's when the floss tends to get splitty. And I don't really like this. I'm going to back off to there. Still got that. Uh, I don't know if that's a trick of the light. Oh, well. Trap it a couple of times. Cut. Now, I could I could try to burnish this. I have a burnishing tool, but usually, it's been my experience that this does won't really help a bump of that magnitude Additionally, it's five turns of ribbing. You can do six and hope that the um, hackle obscures the sixth one. That said, it's not a rule. On a small flies, I always do four. On larger flies, you can go you can go more than five. You know, on some of the Mary Orvis Marbury stuff, or um, certainly um, Rangeley Region streamers, you know, the Black Ghost, White Ghost, Gray Ghost. All right. I'm going to grab a piece of hackle. The hackle, I'd, I'd, I'd like, in a perfect world, I'd like it to extend to the point of the hook or maybe just beyond. And so, you know, I'll, I'll carefully select where I, where I split this. I, t- I tie this in by the tip. I never fold the hackle ahead of time. I always fold it on the fly. You can, you can fold it ahead of time if you prefer. Now you can wind this hackle all the way to the eye if you'd like. And this is this is almost there.
pull this forward, get it, get it out of the way, take some turns. Take one turn around the back. Oops. You want to get it all, though, which I didn't. Back of the bundle. And right here. No, this still isn't. Completely bound down. I've got a couple options here. I think I'm just going to pluck these off. Close enough. All right. Here's where I changed the black thread. Can't believe I remembered. Mm -hmm. Black, I inadvertently got into my black thread. All right, last thing to go on, the wings. I've got a couple prepped here. I'll, I'll, I'll marry one up after I, after I get done mounting this. After I finish the fly, I'll, 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 I'll marry a wing. So you can see the process. To try this again. I collapse the wing. Well, maybe the third time will be a charm. What happened there was I I failed to start far enough on the far enough over.
better. We'll go with this. Spinning the bobbin up to make the thread strong. I've never let go with my left hand. There's a cliff that forms here and you, you just have to be a very aggressive wrapping up. Going to do one more wet finish to get better coverage. If you wind up with five or six whip finish turns, that's pretty good. That means you're your head is small enough. <clears throat> now, I've got some Griff's Thin. That none other than Al Beatty was kind enough to send me. I was bemoaning the fact that they didn't make it anymore. And Al sent me some. And I'm so glad to have it back. What this does, we're going to put shiny stuff on it after this, but What this does is fill in a lot of gaps, just subtle, subtle gaps that you don't notice are there, the thread gaps in particular. I'll typically let that dry. I don't know if this is long enough, long enough time for it to dry. And this is uh, Healthy Hoof, which the uh, FFI people from Texas told me about. And that is the tagless or tipless. I... I always wind up spending a lot of time messing with these tails. Let me see here. 
They were they were they were on there so beautifully. Hmm. They've gotten they've gotten reversed. Oh well. Yeah, you know, you, you tie these things and you, you can sit and play with them for hours. And 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 I do. But uh anyway, uh not not the best version I've ever done, but certainly not the worst. And we have comments and questions. Uh Mike Kelly said, beautiful fly, Eric. And John Wright says, gee, I wish I could do those. Well, you you can. You just you just need to get my document. You just, just need, need to and spend some time with that. Method. Yeah. Hey, Eric, were you going to show us how to marry those uh, yellow to, to red uh, wings? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Yep. Sorry. Really forgot. First of all, I like, I, I was, you know, you, you're going to have two wings, and one, one of the wings is made up of lefts from left feathers, and the other wing, and that's the far wing, and then the near wing is made up from right feathers. These are lefts, so these go together, and I, I've, I've gotten into this habit with, with salmon flies where I only, I only take out the lefts. I'll take out the lefts. I'll make up a left wing. I'll put them away. Then I'll take out the rights because if you get them mixed up, they just will never marry. Lefts only marry to lefts. Rights only marry to rights. So I'll just cut a couple of strips, you know, four strands wide or so off this yellow, um, yellow one here. And see what I'm doing, and they they might be more than four. That's okay. And then I'll, I'll I'll cut a section off of this one that's a little less than that, maybe three. I'm Eric, sorry. Are those goose or duck? These are goose quills. Duck, you would use more. Uh, in other words. Duck, you'd use, and and I said four. I I, I want five. Um, with goose, I like five, four, and five, or something close to that. Uh, as as far as the number of strands. Um, duck, I would want six. I, I'd want one more. Like. Six. Eric, you're kind five, of off five. screen. You're off screen a little bit there, Eric. Uh, yeah. There you, go. there you go. Got it. But bottom line, all I'm doing here is putting these like this in my fingertips, getting the tips more or less aligned, as close as I can come, and then just stroking them. Now, they don't have to marry all the way out to the ends. Th they'll work fine because you're only you really tying in this much. Um, for the for the bigger flies, goose is better for a, for a size, you know, ten, um, ten and twelve. I would definitely use duck quills. So anyway, th this I just took these from lefts. And they were they would make up the far wing. This would make this set would make up the far wing. Any any questions about that? There's 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 one other caveat with this marrying. Try to get feathers that have about the same amount of curvature. <laughs> These feathers are are curved. Um, show you. There, there's like reverse curve across across this wing, curves up on the ends. Qu these are qu uh, duck quills and goose quills 
both do this. You see how that curves up on the, on on this edge. You want to you want to try to get feathers that have a similar amount of that. Sometimes it can be very curvy. For instance, down at the bottom, many times there'll, there'll be a lot of curvature, whereas as the higher you go up, not as much curvature. So try to take them off of similar feathers in the similar area on the feathers. Any any other questions? Hey, Eric, I just want to say thank Eric, you this so is much Jerry for Chris. Uh, tying this for us. It, uh, oh. I don't think I ever would have, have been able to get this right myself um, when I set out to do wet flies and, and a box full of classic wet flies. I don't think I ever would have gotten it should not or had it not been for tricks that you had showed in your own videos and through your website. Um, it, I blame you for my neck hurting tonight. I've been sitting here shaking my head how easy you make this look. And it's just hours upon hours behind the vice. I, I know practicing uh, this because I finally got it right myself. And it just I, I can't say thank you enough for you guys taking the time to to do this tonight. Well, uh, it, it wasn't easy for me this time out. So, you know, sometimes the wing goes right on and sometimes it doesn't. And, uh, you know, you can mount them four or five times. And then if worse comes to worse, you got to throw the slips out and, and try try with another Absolutely. set. You know, hey, Eric, this uh, is, Eric, this is Jerry Chris. Hi, Jerry. Uh, uh, you, you still have that black feather that you made the tail out of? Yeah. Okay, will you show the edge of those barbs along the rake so you can show that sweet spot? You know, there's a spot where, you know, as it gets down near the rake, that starts widening out. And when you try to tie that in in any kind of a slip wing like that, it'll just open up on you. you, you yeah. Know, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You're talking about th this this line that goes down here. Yeah, yeah. Well, show this, it. Show the, the edge of the feather so they can really see right. that if you can, because you can see the width. Yeah. You, you see this line going down here. The only usable part of this feather is from here out to the to the tip. So this is going to be way too short up in here. Yeah. It's not going to work. Whereas you, you get down here, you've got a lot more now to work with from here to here. Yeah, if you tie in behind here. It gets it, it it gets really weird. Yeah, well, it gets meaty there because it gets so the yeah. the rachis widens out so wide. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, but beautiful fly. Beautiful. Oh, well, th thanks, Jer. All right. Is Al among us? Yes. <laughs> oh, the, okay. I'm right, I'm right here waiting for you, buddy. I just was there <laughs> rooting away and learning stuff that I just. Wish I could do. Jeez. No, yeah, I know you can do this stuff. Al. You do I make it. it. E you do make it look easy, and yeah, I can do it. <laughs> and uh, are you ready for me to take off, or you still have some things you want to cover? No, I'm fine. Unless you know, unless anybody else has a question. Okay. Well, before I remove the spotlight, are there any more questions for Eric? I think someone asked where where to get the feathers you're using. Yeah, that's that's a zillion dollar question, isn't it? I search the internet for this stuff. It's harder and harder to find quills of any kind. Uh, there's a big shortage now of of uh, mallard wings, and I had to go to Canada to get some. Um, somebody recommended. Um, Fly tires, or fly fisherman's paradise in Pennsylvania, but that was a no go as well. Um, so I, I've gone to Canada recently. They're 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 hard to come by, but Nature Spirit had a nice line of them for a while, and uh, Hairline has has always had pretty good quality quills. Um, so 
that's the, those are wholesalers, of course. And I, you know, you've got to go through a fly shop, but you know, right now things are tough. Um, so I would just scour online, go to as many sites as you can and just type in quills. And a lot of times they'll come up, they'll have pictures of them and they'll say out of stock, which is heartbreaking, but, but that's what I do. I mean, and then there's John McLean in Detroit can sometimes help with, with, uh, quills, but most of his stuff are, they're not quills. Most of his Feathers are goose secondaries, which don't work for these wet flies. Don't use goose secondaries. Use goose quills or primaries. Or duck, either either one. Or a white, you know, white, white duck that's been dyed. All right. Did that answer yeah, the thanks. question? I, I hope. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Eric. And uh, I am really going to be moving into uh, a slightly different direction, and that is um, quill wings uh, on what I call an MD muddler. What is an MD muddler? MD stands for make do. And all year long, Gretchen and I have committed that when, it, when we can work it in, we will be using whatever material we can come up with to make do. And I'm going to show you some make do options for a muddler. And let's start just by looking at, I've got a make do muddler in there right now. This, these are, these are fold over wings. Do they look good? Nope. When I, when I'm using make do muddlers, they are not for the fly shop. They're not to go in a under glass somewhere mounted on a wall. They're going into my fishing box and that's going to catch fish all day, every day. And we're going to show you how to get into the make do area. One of the things though about make do, now when I say that's a folded wing, we're going to get some feathers out here and take a look at what our options are because I'm willing to bet you, given what Eric just talked about, in the difficulty in finding some of these materials, that you're going to have to either not do the flies or you're going to have to come up with some kind of a substitute. Well, I'm going to start right now with a turkey tail. I'm going to use turkey tail on on uh, some of the some of the stuff. Let me, let me just show you some of the feathers though that we've got here. Look at the gorgeous feathers here. These are just amazing. I have tied some incredible muddlers out of those, and they are not what you normally would look at and consider a muddler feather. But let me just set this aside. That's a, tur that's a turkey tail. And I've got, a, I've got a, a right and a left wing. I'm just going to show you one wing. I don't need to hold both of them up. But uh, I want you to notice that there's, um, you've got your flight feathers. And you can see this is what a flight feather looks like. Let me get this up here so you can see it a little bit better. I want you to notice that it's um, mostly feather on one side, and this side here has got um, biots. And though you may say this not is, is not the feather that you want, those biots are really good to tie with. They just don't happen to be any good for what we're going to be doing. But anyway, after you get away from the the, the flight feathers, or those are as those are called, you've got these other feathers. And um, I want you to notice that we've got a feather here on top just absolutely gorgeous and i want you to notice that on one side it's all nicely modeled on the other side it's kind of dark well those all can be used and in fact i'm going to be using some of these tonight i don't consider those to be the best feathers for tying muddlers and i'm going to be tying <clears throat> uh wing point down that's the way most of the mugglers are tied here in the west and i'm going to be using Feathers out of the center of the wing like that right there. I'm just going to set this aside. And I'm going to talk to you now about options for materials before we get into uh, actually tying the fly. Go right back there to that muddler before I get it out. And 
I'm going to take it out of the vise for right now and set it down. And we're going to start with your last option. But here's a wing that I constructed on a body. This is a, a wing made out of this stuff right here. These are flight feathers. And I want you to see the big gap in the feather there. That's just a big chunk cut out and folded over and turned into a wing. In fact, I don't even have a right and a left here. I have a right and a right or a left and a left, whichever way you want to look at them. They get turned around in these, in these Zoom meetings. But anyway, that's just folded over. So let's look back at that for a sec. That's just folded over. And the area where you're not supposed to be able to tie and all the thick stuff that we, we've talked about, we're going we're gonna to talk about that right now. Let me pull this out of the vise and set it aside for a moment. And let's see, let me pull that out. Okay, you can see the edge right there. It gets really nice and fine out on the left towards the tip. And when it joins the, uh, the shaft, the rachis, whatever you want to call it, it gets really thick. That's not real easy to tie down, but it's not impossible, especially if you use it for a fold-over wing. We just set that aside. We're going to go to the next option, which is let me get the let me get the uh, feather. And you can see that this one takes on a whole different profile. Made out of the same stuff, except I used a right and a left, and you can see the slips that I've cut out of both. In fact, let me get down here, and you can see that there is a slip out of, out of one and out of the other. And again, these are not what you would normally be tying your, your wings out of. But you could be sitting there with a, a desire to go fishing, and not have the materials that you need and based on what eric is saying it might even be difficult to get them and now we're going to move into the other end of the bird we got the the wing end now we're going to go to the tail end i'm going to set that aside and get this last one and this is made out of the tail I've kind of scrunched it around a little bit. It was looked a lot better before. And I want you to notice on this one, this is just the tail that I cut up. You've got, um, let's just take this piece of feather right here. This fly right in front of you was tied out of a piece out of here and a piece out of here. It's got a right and a left. It's just the right and left off the same feather. Is it the thing, the optimal thing that you're doing? No, but it will get you into um, a, a really good looking pattern. On the other hand, this muddler that I showed you as a make do one, I tied that because I had a really beat up wing by taking a really wide slip and folding it over. And that's how that wing came about. Is it perfect? Nope, not even close. But it's uh, it'll it'll do the job if it's destined for your fly box to go to the river. Now let me set this aside. I got one more to show you, and this is going to be uh, some of the better looking stuff materials here. Excuse me, and I want you to notice that I've got what I call a primo muddler feathers, and I've got a slip out of here. Out of a out of a a feather and a slip on the uh, out of the opposite feather, left right. These are just some spares that I've got, and um, they're in varying degrees of not very good. But I wanted to talk to you about these. Let's get back over here for a minute. These look pretty rugged, don't they? You know what fixes them? It's called steam. Your steam kettle, if you're going to make a cup of tea, get the steam kettle out 
put extra water in there, get your tea bag, and when it starts to boil, pour it over your tea bag and, and then let it continue to boil and steam this stuff. And all this raggedy junk along here, not all of it, but an awful lot of it can be fixed. Anyway, I'll set that aside because what I wanted to show you is a wing that's tied out of the proper feather. There is a, a, a proper wing tied out of the what I consider the proper feathers, just the wing and uh, the tail. And of course, you're going to see how it all goes together here in a minute. But setting all this aside now, and now let's go to the recipe. This is for the muddler minnow. By the way, the history on the muddler minnow, it's interesting. It was developed by a fellow by the name of Don Gapin. Um, by all accounts, it seems to have been uh, first produced somewhere in the mid-30s. I've seen a couple of different dates, but 36 seems to show up the most. And Don Gapin is from Minnesota. That's that's what we know about him. And the uh, again, the the wing point points down on the muddler. So we got a streamer wing, uh, 3XL. The thread is going to be gray or your choice. I'm going to be using something different. You'll see why here in a little bit. The tail is a feather slip. And again, it can be your choice. And understand, I've already shown you several options, not best in the world, but things that can work in a pinch. Uh, the rib is going to be optional tinsel or wire. And in fact, I'm going to be showing you a product you may have not ever, never seen before. And the body is going to be tinsel or floss. The underwing will be hair, and I'm going to use squirrel. It's a lot, sometimes we use bear, and there's others that we use as well. Sometimes calf tail. The wing is a feather slip wing. The collar will be deer hair, and the head will also be deer hair. Now let's let's get over here to the materials area. Al, and take a good look. I mean, something. Uh, somebody asking the question. Yeah, Al, on yeah. the tail. There's always a question that comes up when you use the term feather slip in the singular. Now, is the tail a matched pair or is it a single slip? You're going to see that when we get to it, but it's um, it's uh, one from the right, one from the left. You call okay. it a matched pair or whatever you want. You're yeah. looking at the two feathers right there uh, that are going to be used to tie the fly that you're going to see here in a minute. Not, yeah. the, not the best feathers. But they're right and left, and they're going to be matched up and, and all, all of that type of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Let me just move this in a little bit closer. All right. And I've tied several out of, out of this, as you can well see. I took the slips out of this side and this side. I usually, when I'm on the muddlers that I tie, I make the slip the width of a hook one size smaller than the one in the vise. And um, you can see where they where they come from. Let's just set that aside. Squirrel tail. I'll just set this over here so they're all together. All right. Now let's get down here to the hair. I know we go through this very often. And let's talk about hair for a minute. And this will be deer hair that I'm going to be using. However, it is possible to use elk. All right, here's my, here's my picture. And the dark hair along the backbone, down over the shoulder, down over the rump, is good for wings and tails. And if you try to tie muddlers out of it, you're going to be frustrated. Here's an example of that kind of hair. I want you to notice how dark it is. That doesn't flare with a darn. You might get it to flare down in this area, but that's so far out into the, uh, away from the tip that if you're trying to flare it there, it's big enough for probably a 2.0 or a 3.0 type hook. In other words, this isn't going to do, do the job because the tying area is all this dark stuff. So if you happen to have that, set it aside. You'll be nothing but frustrated trying to tie muddlers with it. Now, I'll put that over here out of the way. Now, here's one that's kind of in the middle. And in fact, what it is, is it's hair that's not on the backbone totally. It's down starting into the rib area. And this is what I'm going to use today. It's, uh, I'm, I'm able to flare it just fine within an area close to the, 
close enough to the tips to, to fit the hook that I'm going to be tying with. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I want to use it. And the other one is it's, it's got a little curve in it. The darn thing drives me nuts. I'll show you how to straighten them out, but I'm trying to get rid of this darn thing. So I'm using it everywhere I can. All right. And the last thing is the hair that gets down into the rib area, the lighter stuff. Okay. This area and this area. And here's a, here's some that's just, down in the rib area, and it's pretty light colored all the way through to the tip. It's going to flare really good no matter where you're using. So you ask yourself, what am I going to do when I go to the fly shop? What am I going to look for? Well, you know what you're going to look for for wings and tails. You're going to look for the darker stuff. But you also know what to look for for the spinning stuff for, for muddlers. One of the things that I'm willing to bet you, 20% of the hair that you look at in the fly shop it's going to be wings and tails. 80% is going to be, well, you figure it out. There's a lot more area here that will do the job of um, for spinning hair. All right. Now let me, I've got all that set aside. One last chance here. I've got to use my static guard because static electricity has been crazy around here lately. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to get back to the hook. And I'm just going to set one of these hooks in the vise right now. All right. <clears throat> now, I want to just refer to one thing here. I want to show you a mess. You see this? That is from a spool of Danville 60 thread. That stuff would just... I'd look at it and it would fall apart. I'm kind of being a little bit facetious, but this stuff would break very easily. It had gotten dry rotted. Now, there was a time when I would take and throw the whole spool away thinking it was all bad. It's not. Let me set this aside. I'm going to be tying this fly tonight with 6-0 thread. And this is what's left of that spool. I took out about the first 20 wraps 20 yards, there's about 20 yards in there all wadded up. And I finally got down to good thread. And uh, so before you throw away a spool of thread that seems to have gone bad, make sure that it's all bad. A lot of times you can strip off a few layers on the outside and get down to good stuff again. But anyway, enough of all that, of, of all that except I am going to start my thread base at the division line between the front in the back of the fly. And you'll see what I mean by the front and the back. But the back is the body, the wings, and the tail. And the front is the hair hackle and the hair head. So let me just wrap here. Now I'm just going to pick up the pace because I think you know how to wrap thread. Now you've already seen how Eric will take his um, slips out, measure them, take them out. I do the same thing. I mean, I'll just, I'll grab the slips here. What I usually do is I always do mine from the back. And I think I saw Eric do that too. And you just reach in, you, you cut a, you cut a, you cut one out. And you got the slip there. Well, I'm not going to do that because in the interest of time, I'm just going to grab two slips that I already cut off of that same feather that you just saw, one, one off of the right, one off the left. And that's going to be my tail. So I'll just set these in place. I want you to notice how those feathers came apart. Well, that's good, actually, because I wanted them to, because I want them to kind of get down around the sides of the hook. Because the tail is uh, what I want right here, setting right here. And... Setting this in place, you know, when Eric brought his thread over, let it down, let it sink, and grab the feather, that's a form of thread torque control. And you need to do that to control the way the, the, these wings and tails go in place. I don't care what, what uh, fly you're tying, you're going to have to do that. Well, now I have a slightly different way of controlling that. And I'm just going to come up between... <clears throat> Finger and thumb with a pinch. And I want you to notice that I take my outside finger. You see how I'm just rolling that little bit? 
That little maneuver is the difference between success and failure and putting on a quill tailor wing. Now let me get it all back here in place. Oh, and all I'm going to do is just take and pull it into place. Tighten it up right there. And that gives me my tail. With um, all this messing around with it, I managed to knock some fibers loose. I'll get those later. Right now, what I'm going to do is start wrapping forward. Because I, my underbody is going to be formed out of the waist from the wing or from the tail. And I'm keeping those thread wraps pretty close together. And I'm also getting close to my point up here. Let me rotate the vise so that you can see right there is a division between front and back. This waist from the tail cannot, I say again, cannot go into the area for, for the hackle and for the head. So I'll just trim that off now. And what I'm doing is defeating material creep so that when I wrap that down, it comes pretty close to that division line, but it does not cross over. Now I'm going to quickly grab my tweezers and pull these out. All right, there we go. Anyway, I got that married back together. <clears throat> now it's time to get rid of this and introduce you to a material that you may or may not have um, uh, know anything about. Let's set this 6 L aside for the moment. Remember now, this was really bad thread, breaking and everything, and now it's just, I got down to the good stuff, and as it turned out, that was a pretty new spool of thread, and I got a lot of thread left here to tie flies on. Set that aside, aside, and I'm going to introduce you to the rib material. This is not tinsel. This is metallic sewing thread from the thread store. And it says, let me get there. It says, good broad, 650 yards, seven bucks. And uh, the number is 9004, if you guys are wanting to know. But anyway, a metallic thread out of the sewing store makes some incredible stuff for for your um, for ribbing. I use it all the time unless I'm working on customer orders or something that's going to be mounted and go under glass or or some or some type of um, display item. And the other thing I'm going to use now is I'm going to switch to orange floss, and this is the floss that we took Gretchen and I brought to Danville. <clears throat> back in the early 90s, and Gretchen found it in a Bernina sewing store in Bozeman, and we said, you guys have got to put this stuff on the market. It's the greatest. Well, it wasn't in the right colors. Anyway, bottom line is, with a lot of negotiation with Danville, they brought this stuff on the market in about 94 or 95 and called it Nylon Stretch. Now, Uni has a similar product out on the market. It's called Uni Stretch. But what I want you to notice is that this is all fibrous. It never gets twisted. It gets twisted all over the place, but it never causes you to get a, a twisted application on your thread hook. So I can wrap a floss body and with a bobbin and not get any twists in my body. There'll be twists in this stuff, but we don't care. It'll just untwist when I clip it off. But if you think you're going to spin and cord up your thread, that ain't going to happen. Never will. Well, I just put a couple turns in there and started. And we're going to show you a little trick of kind of getting the, your uh, ribbing material into uh, um, a good location. Now, notice how I'm just kind of grabbing that right there and, and binding it into place. We'll take a couple of more turns. And I'm just going to stop. Take that little, little thing off, and I'm just going to let the thread hang there. The weight of the bobbin is going to position 
my flaw or my rib material right on the bottom of the body. And it also forces every turn of floss that I'm putting on to be tight against the previous turn. Just let that position everything. If I'd quit hitting that tail, it wouldn't come apart on me. I think that's what happened to Eric on his tail because it was perfect when it went on the fly. <clears throat> anyway. All right, now I'm just going to come back forward. I want you to notice though, how smooth that floss body is. And if you were doing that with standard floss, by this time, it would be roped up and causing anything but a smooth body. But I'll pick up the pace now. All righty. Now, here we go. I'm just going to trim off this waist to rib. Okay, and now I'm going to switch from floss back. No, I'm not. I'm just going to whip finish this off, or I'm going to half hitch it off. Maybe a whip finish sounds better. All right. Now I'm just going to put my rib on. And I want you to notice I'm going to use the rotating function of my vise to put on a rib. All right, now we'll put the, the thread on. Remember, I don't want to go forward of my demarcation point here. It's the property line between two neighbors in a subdivision, whatever you want to call it. You can't, you can't cross over. You can't build a fence on the, across the property line from your neighbor. So let's just tie off this rib. Trim off the waist. And before I put it away, I'm just going to, I always store it with a, with a hackle pliers on it. And why? Because I got lots of hackle pliers in my inventory. And it keeps just everything nice. Because one of the things, this stuff is a real pain in the neck to get into a bobbin. But we'll set that aside. And now let's uh, get over here to the materials area. Yeah, there we go. And we'll get some squirrel tail. Now, I'll set that aside. I don't need that right now. Squirrel tail. Squirrel tail, tail is normally bunched up like this. And in a, in a Zoom presentation a while back, I spread this apart like, I did, like you see it right now. And how did I do that? I used a hair dryer to blow the stuff. And if you blow a hair dryer on this, it just spreads it out so nice getting it all ready to become wing material. And I'm just going to go ahead and cut off. Now that's too short. I'll get, throw that away. And now let's just get this right here. We want to keep, keep our wings sparse. Too often the underwing on muddlers is way, way overdressed. All right. So I'm just going to make sure I don't have any crooked ones in there and make sure all the shorties are out of there. Okay, looking good. And I want that to come just about um, somewhere around the middle of the tail, give or take. All right, now we'll just get a trim off the waist. Remember, this, we don't want that to come forward of the debarkation point. So I'm going to trim that off now. And let's, let's see if we made it. We're good. Okay. Now it's time to add our wing. <clears throat> Before I do that, though, I want to I want to show you something. This is used to be a uh, dubbing whorl. Well, it had two prongs on it, and you know it spread apart, and you put your dubbing loop in it, and all that stuff. Well, I cut one off and bent it down out of the way, and I made this makeshift. Wait, you'll see what I'm going to use that for here in just a minute. 
But first, let's get our wings up here. Another set of slips that I just pulled off of those feathers that I pointed out to you. And I want the, the, the curved down tip of the wing to come down to the curved down tip of the tail, just like that. That's the way I like my muddlers to go. I guarantee you, though, you're going to see everything under the sun from wing, wings that set like that. And if you go to the Dan Bailey Fly Shop in Livingston, you'll see the wings up like this. Everybody has a way that they think is the best way to have it, have them set. And I just happen to like mine this way. I think it pulls down into a, a really nice profile of um, of the wing of the wing that I want in a, of a minnow. <clears throat> anyway, so we're going to stop right here. I'm going to hold these in place, spread them out so that they're on either side of that hook eye. Yeah, that looks good. That looks good. Now, remember that weight hook with the weight on it? I'll just hang that right over my bobbin. You can't see that, so let me twist it up. Let me, oh, let me go to the offside camera. There you can see it. I just, um, I'll put it on there again. Here's the device, and I just hook it over my thread so it's hanging on the bobbin. Now, what we're going to do is give you a foolproof way to get a perfect wing collapse every time because now I have the weight of the bobbin and the weight on the other side and it will pull nothing but straight down. Now, I'll do that over. I'm going to bring this back like this and I'll recollapse that wing for you. Hold the thread between the finger and the thumb. Drop the bobbin down the other side. Drop it. Now take off the weight. Pull out the slack and continue tying your fly. And that's just about the way I want it to be. Now I am going to wrap into here just a little bit and trim off the waist. And again, I don't want that to creep forward. And I'll just uh, tie this off. And this is what I call the gills. I usually do this in red. I'm not going to worry about it now. Because I always tie my flies up to this point and uh, use some glue on it. And I always glue the wing right there and then the gills and set that aside to dry. Well, in the interest of time, I've already got one made, constructed up to this point. And besides, I screwed that wing up and all the talking and showing you how to do stuff, I messed the wing up. Well, that's just the way it goes. I've got one here that's the way it ought to be. And it's, the glue is already dry. So I'll set that aside and bring this one up and put it in the vise. As Eric can tell you, the, the pressure of wrapping live on, on, on Zoom, I don't know what it is. It seems to mess me up every now and then. But anyway, there's the, the body with the glue all dried. Now I'm going to switch to my um, 6 0 thread. That's what I'm using to spin the hair. And I'll just attach... There we go. It's now attached. <clears throat> Let's get back over and get some hair. And I'm just going to take some of this and I'm going to use, this is going to be for the collar. And I'll just cut a piece of this. But I told you that this hair has got a slight curve to it. Really just drives me nuts. Doesn't stack worth a darn. Let me get back here and I'll show you what I mean. You see there that uh, that hair kind of curves down a little bit. Well, I'm going to show you how to straighten it out. You take your thumbnail and your forefinger and you just kind of go along the outside of the bend. And that straightens all that hair out. Now I'm going to slip out here away from the vise and the camera and get out over my waist bin and just get rid of all the trash that's in there. The, the short stuff and uh, the fuzzy stuff. Oh, good. I'm glad I sprayed things down with static guard because... 
it would have been sticking to me by now. <clears throat> and I'll grab my hair stacker. All right. <clears throat> Okay, we've got the hair stacked. I've got one bad hair in there I can see already. We'll get rid of that. And I'm going to want this to go on the hook so that it gets uh, almost back to the, to the point, but not quite. And um, so that means it's going to have to sit there on the hook. I'll switch hands, and I'm going to cut off the waist here. And it's, it's going to cut right across there. But I'm going to move off camera to do that so that we don't end up with this hair all over the camera. Okay, I just cut it all. And now, as you can see, it's cut off. I want you to notice how I'm kind of squiggling it down around the hook. Second turn, third turn. Now, I've got it. Pretty much in place the way I want to see. I want you to notice how I'm pushing that down on the side there. I didn't spin this at all. I'm trying to give you guys a tip out there that if you can't spin hair, baloney. You don't have to. Put it in place, tie it down, and then you can push it around to where you want it to be. Now, that's the collar. And we've got a pretty Pretty good distribution. I don't want much on the bottom. I'm going to cut it off the bottom. Uh, that's pretty good. But you know what? I can still rearrange it some. Uh, that's too much there. Let me move it over here some. Take that old thumbnail, and you can move that hair around under those turns of thread. But there we've got, got it, uh, our, our muddler collar ready to go. And now it's time to spin our first bundle of hair. Now let's get over here. And I'm just going to take some of, the, some of the same hair. And what I didn't show you before, but I'll show you now, is I need to get rid of the waste right out of there. And if I just pull on that, just pull it out, stroke it out, stroke it out, or even try to comb it out, the way it is here in, the, in, in my area, I'll, have, I'll be building up stat static electricity. But I want to ra rapidly move my finger up and down through the base ends so that uh, I can clean that out. Now, I'm going to do that over here at the waste bin on the way back to the vise. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> and then we'll just move in here. And I'm just going to take this hair, and now we're going to do a spin. I'm just going to... One, two, three, snug but not tight. Let's cut off the waist, the tips. And now, one of the things that you want to do is just put tension on and allow that, allow that to come around the thread. And you see, it, it didn't come and do a good job. It's, there's a bad spot right here. It didn't cover. Remember the thumbnail trick. You can move that stuff back around, especially if you recall. Well, let me take this off. I'm going to go back to something, and then I'll, I'll just pick up the pace here in a minute. You remember that I cut most of this off and, and cinched it down, so it's not getting in my way. Now, I'm going to really quickly get over here, clean out some hair, and quit messing around and get to spinning some hair. Okay, now I'll just put this bundle back in. <clears throat> okay, three turns. Spin it. Put it the way you want it. Pull it back. <clears throat> Get another bundle. And I'm cleaning out the waste. Get out over, over the waste bin. And I'll just, uh, again, three turns. Cut off the waist, spin it the way I want it. If it doesn't quite get where I want it, I'll just twist it into place. You notice how I left those butt ends pretty long there? That's so that I can get in and 
apply the materials for the whip finish. And we'll pull this up, hook it in there, trim it off. Now it's time to trim our muddler head. I want my muddler flat along the bottom, and I often see fly tires have a dickens of a time getting the head not to be lopsided or getting the head even on all the, all the way around trim. They, Trim really nice on one side, and then you look at the other side, and it's lopsided. Well, I'm going to show you a, a, a trick that seems to work for me. You can see if it works for you. I'll just trim flat along the bottom. Okay, there it's flat. Now, folks usually would just then start trimming and trying to make it look nice and pretty and everything. Well, if you'll square it up, it's just kind of like... Do some carpentry work on the darn thing. Square it up here. Square it up on the sides. It's a lot easier to cut a straight line than it is to do. A, and you can see now it's pretty well squared up. And it's just about the same length on this side as it is on the near side. And that's good. So now I can start kind of evening things up. Now, do I trim all mine this way? No. I'm just giving you a, a method that works really well. And now it's time to cut off some of these long ones. The long ones that got back into the collar. Well, if you try to reach in and cut that, I'll guarantee you you're going to cut the collar. But if you'll take your scissors and just lay them flat, push back on the collar, and then come forward, and you capture the front ones, and the collar stays uninjured. Push back, come forward, clip. Push back, come forward, clip. And we'll just do that all the way around. I got one hair, though, that doesn't want to get with the program. Well, we'll uh, keep after it. There we go. And now you can you can round it up and and shape the head the way you want because you have the base, the foundation, if you will. You've got your framework in there. Put in there with, a, with your square. And I could just fiddle away like Eric did. I could fiddle away forever on this thing, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to call that good enough for now. And I'll finish trimming it up later, getting those little, little babies out of the way. Any questions, though? Okay, looks to me like it's time to bring Eric up here again and uh, add spotlight. Any questions for the two of us? Al, <clears throat> uh, I, I just wanted to say I, that squaring, the, the, the starting with it square makes so much sense. I've never been smart enough to do that on muddlers. And uh, the heads have driven me crazy. So that's, that's great. I, I love that. Good. I don't, but uh, quite frankly, I I couldn't. I didn't. I had. I was like you. I got really good at trimming them, but boy, I sure messed up a lot of them in learning them. And then one day, I was at the fly shop in Bozeman. I can't remember if I was after we moved there or whether I was just there on a trip. But anyway, there was a bunch of Dave's hoppers came in, and all the heads were trimmed square. Mm. I said, "Holy criminy!" That's the answer. And of course, it, it wasn't on a Dave's Hopper that I needed to worry about. It, you square it up and then you round the edges and go from there. Anyway. I, I had something I wanted to show that I forgot about. Absolutely. Let me get you my highlighted. Presentation. Let me Just get you a highlighted. quick thing. Oh, 
Okay, remove spotlight. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me get my. All right. Now I can see. I yeah. I see colored screen that, right now. Yeah, hang on, hang oh. on, hang on. I'll get it. There. All right. What I really wanted to show you, not the fly. By the way, I did fix the tail. But uh, this, um, I wanted to show you, th this is the, the worst example I could find. But a lot of times you'll buy quills or, or if you order them online, they come in and they've got all these, they're wrinkled, okay, is the best way to describe it. And Don Bastian used to talk about um, ironing the quills, which can be done, certainly. And I've done that. But what works even better for me is I'll dampen the quill with a little bit of water and then use uh, my wife's hair straightener, um, which has two, two flat jaws kind of like this. Is that one of those heated straightener thingies? Y yeah, yeah. And, oh, and yeah, Gretchen's got one of those too, yeah. Yeah, and uh, surprisingly enough, it doesn't damage the hair straightener. Now, I used I used my wife's old one that she didn't use anymore, uh, uh, so I, I I I'm not swearing that you know that your wife's going to be happy with you using it on a feather. If but, it's used on a feather, she won't care. Yeah, right. Gretchen won't. My wife, if I had used her good one, that that would have been a problem. But this, but these hair straighteners, they heat up to the, you know, the temperature of the sun approximately, and man, it'll it'll straighten out a, a quill feather right now. But you got to keep it moving, you know. You don't want to let it sit there, um, and, and just fry your feather. But anyway, that's something I thought of when with your okay. approach to the to the muddlers, not you know, not using your best feathers. So well, my best feathers go out the door to customer orders. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mine go to my friends. All my good fry flies go to my friends and leaving me with the, the really crappy stuff that it's no wonder I don't catch any fish. <laughs> so Al, what you need to do is uh give uh give Gretchen a gift of a new hair hair straightener. Just Thought she could use a new one, and then you can take her old. I, I, I guarantee I know which which I'll find the spot on Amazon in two clicks, and she'll have a new a new one before the end of the week. Well, not before the before the end of next week. Yeah. Hey, Al, this is Jerry. Hey, just uh, on that steaming thing, very very good coincidence on John's uh, on the Riverkeeper Fly blog today was he shows two. Two flies that were totally squashed, and he puts and he has them puts them over the tea kettle, and you can watch all the feather just the hackle straighten right out. The deer hair wing goes perfectly flat. It's just beautiful. My ex, my question is, on the deer hair, uh, on the on the squirrel hair that you put in, is that like a support for for that wing? Is that what it? That's is that its property? Is that why you don't flare it? You leave it straight on top. I leave it straight because all it does is it's support for the wing. Because after the first fish, the I don't care what you use unless you glue them in place, the wings will be shredded. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then just right. they just blend in with the hair, and and you've just now got a fly you can go ahead and fish. Yeah. 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 The the, the thing on John's was so so incredible. One of them was it was like two uh, two stone flies, and they were crushed. <clears throat> And they just came right back to life. The hackles opened right back up. It was it was really quite quite cool. It's anyway, it's great totally, presentation. Totally amazing what the what the steam will do. Yes. Yeah, great information. Thank you. Wonderful stuff. Al, thank you so much for for a masterclass on. This is one of my absolute favorite streamers to use. It's and it's a an absolute it's kind of like the uh, woolly bugger. It's. It's one of the classics that I always seem to catch, and it's one that I find myself struggling with um, time after time. And, and mm -hmm. I've 
I have learned so many tips and tricks from from watching you put this together that just opened up Pandora's box. So if my wife uh, is to blame me for using all of her um, hair products, she who must be obeyed, I, I will let her know to send her complaints to Mr. Albedi. <laughs> Don't use my name. It was actually Eric Austin's fault. But <laughs> well, thank you both. For sure, for sure. <laughs> Nothing else? No other comments? I wanted to comment on what Jerry talked about with the steam. And I'm just going to tell you a, a little story. Uh, back in the early 80s, I think it was about 82, I was a silent partner in a fly shop in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And um, so I'm going to don't have permission to use the family name and everything. So I'll just say the, the guy's name was X, Y, Z. And I said, hey, X, how's it going? Where'd you get this great looking peacock? He says, it's the same as the peacock right next to it. And here, here was two barrels of peacock in this guy's fly shop. Premium, regular grade. Wow. $3. Five dollars. Wow. Heck of a deal. He says, Come here, I'll show you how we make it. I said, make it. So he grabbed one of the one of the regular ones in about 30 seconds under the steam and it went into the premium one. <laughs> the value added. Of course, once people learn about that stuff, well, that does the same thing to flies. I mean, uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've taken flies after they've been fished, and you just kind of puff them all up again and they're ready to. Look like they're all brand new. You can't quite sell them, but they're in good shape. <clears throat> I watched a guy at the Denver Fly Show uh, spinning uh, beautiful deer hair flies, and he would construct the fly, and before doing any trim, trim work with the razor blade and, and such, he would steam the deer hair, and it would cause it all to just stand straight up and where it was a uh, little bit compressed or uh, twisted around, it would straighten everything out and make it uh, stand more straight out. And then when he cut it with the razor blade, it was almost like styrofoam. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on East Meets West. For now, it's a wrap until next week. See ya.